Good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stice, the Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites and our monthly edition of Show Me the Science. Today, we're taking you inside the operating room to see the work of our expert burn team. Fireworks keep them really busy this time of year, but instead of showing you watermelons blown up by M80s or hot dogs burned by sparklers, we're going to show you just a snippet of what it takes to heal a severe burn. And we'll hear directly from someone whose night at a house party ended up in the burn unit. One war warning if you're squeamish, we are going to show some footage and photos of burn injuries on this program. We will spare you the most graphic images, but the pictures can still be a little shocking. Later today, we're gonna to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson to discuss the new CDC health alert on dengue virus. So joining me today on the desk are two surgeons, Dr. Davil Basar, not bad, and Dr. Julia Slater, got that one right. Dr. Slater is also the medical director of the Burn at Burn Center here at the health system. And also joining us is a very special guest, Jordi Lauterbach, who spent weeks in the burn unit back in 2012. We'll hear how she ended up there and what it took to get her home. We're also delighted to visit with Katherine Golson, the nurse manager for the burn unit, who will give us a tour of what is called the tank room. We should establish right off the bat, leave fireworks to the professionals. Last year, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission counted 9,700 firework injuries and eight deaths. The highest rates of injuries were among teens and children. Dr. Slater, Dr. Bobsler, do you think some people simply don't appreciate the danger or they just think it's all fun and games? I would rather say not some, quite, <coughs> quite a bit a lot. And I think it comes with a certain gender and age. Male, teenagers, <laughs> and young 20, 20, and maybe a little early 30s. Yes. And unfortunately, that is our most common kind of uh, demographics for injury starting tomorrow. It, in fact, started early. Uh, before July 4th, we already got our early patients. But I think it will continue through the weekend, and I hope not beyond. So, medical director. Yes. Does the team just kind of look at July 4th on the calendar? They just look at that and say, and look at it with dread about what's about to happen? Well, I don't think our team dreads it because everyone that's involved in the burn team is just so devoted to taking care of our burn injured patients. So I think there's a little bit of excitement, but there's a lot of preparation. So we are getting ready for the holiday. We have um, pulled our staffing in a specific way that we have extra hands on deck if we need it, um, both for the holiday itself and then as Dr. Bossart alluded to the days after as we prepare to see patients and unfortunately in the emergency room and in our burn unit. So <clears throat> earlier it said we're going to uh, make a point that fireworks should be with professionals. Do you, are you suggesting that professionals don't hold an M80 in their hand, light it, and then try to throw it a few, dis few yards away? Is that, is that what you're suggesting? Absolutely. I think that's the, the definition of a professional who is going to do it from distance, do it in a safe way, and make sure everyone around them are also safe. And I'm guessing alcohol and fireworks are a bad combination. I bet most absolutely. professionals aren't drunk when they're trying to play with fireworks. Or Ab absolutely. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Anything that's going to impair your ability to consider what is safe and what isn't safe, or your ability to get away from something that's dangerous is, is not a good combination with fireworks. Well, Jordy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Take us back to 2012. I understand you were on the back of a trailer which is loaded with fireworks that weren't supposed to go off, but uh, something happened. Something did happen. I was at a house party for the 4th of July, and was actually one of the people that it was a few days after the 4th, that um, was standing on a trailer ramp talking to someone similar to how we're standing now, and someone came up and put a mortar in the wrong size pipe. At the time I didn't know, and most people don't, that there's different diameters within those mortar shells, um, but it got shoved down in there. And so- By mortar shell, it's a, it's a firework. It's a firework, oh yes. Yeah. The big pretty booms that go off in the sky. Um, so instead of it going up and exploding, it went out within the pipe, therefore lighting everything around it. And unfortunately at the foot of the ramp was a cardboard box of about 300 mortar shells which started to ignite at one time, which then let everything else in the trailer. Altogether, I was told there was anywhere from like ten to $15,000 worth of fireworks My. involved. And within seconds, everything had caught on fire and was igniting. So we're gonna show some photos from when you were still on the burn unit. 
Uh, that burn looks really painful. Yes. Can you take it, kind of put that into words and describe it for us? The best way I have ever been able to explain it is you are hyper aware of every nerve ending that you have. And it feels like every nerve ending is on fire and being stabbed by needles. Okay, that, that doesn't really sound very pleasant. Now, Dr. No. Bob, sorry, you treated Jordy. And yes. I take it these are second and third degree burns. Can you first of all tell us what that means? What is a second and a third degree burn? So secondary burn is where the outer layer of the skin that gives a little bit of color or epidermis is uh, lost. It's burned. Also, the part of the dermis that is the deeper layer of the skin that is also burned. At various depth of that second degree burn decides whether someone will heal those burns or will not be able to heal it really well. So when that second degree burn is very deep and it goes through the layers beyond like say two thirds of the dermal thickness, then those burns generally take either a long time or will never be able to heal. Third degree burns are where the entire skin thickness is burned. And usually those burns are not kind of able to heal themselves unless it's a very small spot or small area. And that's when you have to think about skin grafts, is that right? That's Talk when we skin. have to plan for skin grafting to help those wounds heal well. Um, and most of the second degree burns, when treated well and when kind of well taken care of, should heal even with the large surface area burn that uh, Jordy had. So, just to say it out loud, it, 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 what percentage of your total body area was burned? Do you remember the percent? I was just under 20%, I believe. Okay. And we used to say that, and I don't think this is probably still true, you guys much better than we, we did when I was working with the burning back in the 90s, but burn area plus age could equal mortality rate. It does, there is a significant bur uh, mortality rate with Absolutely. burn injuries. Absolutely, and I think, I think that um, kind of equation is more and more true with older age um, and when the burn is much larger. Yeah, yeah. There, you can't have an 80% burn injury on the program because there aren't many that have Correct. survived. It, Correct. It's so difficult, and it's so easy to happen. It happens in a flash of a moment. Mm -hmm. As I'm taking, a, uh, were you a fireworks fan before this? I wasn't. <laughs> and I bet um, that didn't change after the injury. No, yeah. now I usually work on the 4th of July. <laughs> that's that's rude. And Sonia, we have some photos of your burns as they healed. And um, appearance-wise, they, they do look better. Talk to us about the recovery process and how much rehab you had to do. So, recovery process, um, you start with lotion therapy, Four to five times a day I was doing almost like a deep tissue massage into my burns just to keep them well lubricated um, to prevent the uh, forming of keloid scarring or the thick scarring that you can see on some people to keep my scars nice and flat. I wore compression stockings and unfortunately because they were my, it was my, both my legs and my arm, I got to basically wear full body oh, yeah, for a year job. and I listen to Dr. B. I did everything he said to a T for that full year. Um, I did have a little bit of physical therapy just to make sure I was maintaining my mobility in both of my feet and ankles. Just so, so they can contract and you, if you're not careful, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that was a lot of, now how long were you in the hospital? 17 days. It's a long darn time. It was. Is that a pretty typical story for a burn patient? Yeah. Generally, you know, we kind of say loosely it's about a day for every percent TBSA. So with Jordy saying she was just under 20% and she was there for 17 days, that's pretty spot on. Yeah. So 12 years later, do you still feel pain? Um, occasionally in the winter, if it gets too cold, I can feel a little bit of nerve pain in my ankles and feet, but predominantly day to day life, no. I don't. And you've got some children at home. I do. Right? How many kids do you have? I have two little boys. Awesome. Now, how old are they? One and two. Okay. So, it's they're young, so you probably haven't really taught them too much about fireworks. No. But what are you going to teach them about fireworks? They're for the professionals. Yeah. They are fun <clears throat> and they're cool to watch, but we don't always need to touch them. Because I wasn't even touching them that night and I was still affected by it. Yeah. So. so, Dr. Slater, you let us... Uh, bring a camera into your operating room. Mm -hmm. We saw a case where someone had boiling hot liquid spilled on their foot and this is where we need to pause and warn viewers. We're going to show you some footage of the burn injuries, a little graphic. Let's take a look at that footage. Now Dr. Slater, walk us through 
this graft procedure and, and this whole thing about skin grafting and things like that. Sure. So first you're going to see us kind of take down the <coughs> dressing. You're not going to see us when we get in there. Um, go ahead. But the first step is to really remove that not healthy tissue. Um, once we've removed that, then we can do a graft. And it's important to note, as Dr. Bofsar already talked about, it's really those deep second degree that aren't healing or the full thickness third degree that we're going to graft. And that doesn't matter how they got injured, whether it's fireworks or hot water like this patient. Um, what you're seeing right now is that we're actually taking the skin graft. So that's a very thin shave of skin from the patient's thigh. I kept it on the same leg so that um, there would only be pain on one leg from where where I did the surgery, but I also take it up higher away from the injury just because that's a spot where you can put some shorts on and cover the scar for the donor site. Um, once we have that very thin shave of skin, we're going to put it on this machine called a mesher. And what you just saw them put a little bit of just salt water or saline on top of it to help make it more pliable and easier to get it through the machine. And that machine cuts holes in our graft. And there's two reasons for that. In this, where it's a small wound, we cut the holes so that any fluid that comes out from the wound bed can get out and doesn't affect mm -hmm. our graft healing. But if we have a very large burn injury, we can cut even bigger holes in the graft so that the skin will spread a lot further and we can use less donor to cover oh, more wow. burn wound site. I'm interested, this reminds me of trying, my trying to get cellophane off a wrapper. I was watching, <laughs> I, I always, it, it, it always crinkles. It can be crinkles very and I, tricky uh -huh. to get it nice and smooth and get a really nice even mesh on it. But our team is, is very skilled and, and have a lot of practice doing it. And so. we, that, that you saw that clip where the graft is being placed on a foot, and then you're, you sprayed it with some stuff too. What, what's that about? Yeah, I think we're about to, to see the spray part that we're getting ready there. So that's a fibrin glue that we use. Fibrin is something that's naturally in your body anyway that your body uses to stop bleeding, but it's also very sticky. And it allows me to stick that graft down um, and have it stay in place without having to put staples on that would have to be removed later that would be painful. Okay. Oh yeah, wow, that's really amazing, isn't it? Now, in addition to the graft, you're adding some other material that looks like skin. Talk to us about what that is. Yeah, we're gonna see that in just a minute. First, we're gonna, I think, dress the donor site right there with just a dressing so that that thin, uh, uh, area that we injured can heal. It heals a lot like if you've had a road rash or a, uh, yeah. a, a, a brush burn, anything like that. Sometimes that's the most painful spot, it's isn't all, it? It's almost always the, the most painful spot because right it, it's basically at the depth of a more superficial burn. Yeah. And as your burn gets deeper and affects more nerves, it doesn't hurt as much. So 99% of the time, my patients are going to say it's the donor site that bothers them. Um, and there's that material that kind of looks like skin. That's Xeroform. It's a dressing material. has a little bit of antimicrobial property to it, but it, it helps it to not stick with the whole dressing once we put it on so that when the patient's getting their dressing taken off, we can try to minimize the discomfort with the dressing change as much as possible. Um, and we have a clip for one more clip from a different surgery, a young child burned by hot ramen. I hear ramen is a common cause of burns. That would have jumped, would not have jumped out at me until I saw that in the program. Yeah. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, in general, any scald or contact are gonna be our two most common causes for children because they're curious and they tend to be short. So they're reaching for things, they're pulling them down. And I don't know if it's just a matter of, oh, ramen, they, they think they can get their own lunch. It's, it's there and they don't appreciate that it's hot. Yeah. Um, but it's very common. And of course, then you're dealing with both the hot liquid, but also the the hot noodles and that tends to lead to a deeper burn. So um, one thing we see in the video um, is the temperature. How hot is it inside the operating room and why? Yeah, so if you've ever had surgery and you've gone, you remember going into the operating room, you probably thought, boy, it's really cold in here and that's to help perfect, uh, prevent infection but also because all of the staff in the OR is wearing a lot of extra layers with the gowns, the gloves, and we have really big lights that are on us so it gets warm. But when you have a large burn, one of the primary things your skin does is really temperature management. And so you can't keep yourself warm if you have a large burn. And so we actually make the room anywhere from like 80 to 95 degrees so that we can keep our patients warm wow. and, and we kind of just sweat it out. <laughs> So one thing we've been talking about are the burns, but sometimes burns are accompanied, especially with fireworks, by explosive injuries where people lose parts of their body. And that, that is, again, very common in any explosive. Like, think of that M80 as the explosive, and the person who gets injury is the one holding it. 
on the hand. So l losing kind of fingertips to whole finger and worst is the whole hand, especially if it's a younger child. That explosive power is such that we have had patients, young patients, losing entire hand because of those. So again, I know that as a child, I was excited about fireworks. Oh, I've, I've done it. Yeah. I will never allow my child to do it. And the reason is I've seen enough injuries and no matter like how careful you are, eventually use of those fireworks in a, in a non-professional setting causes injury. Now, there are statistics, right? Oh yeah, it, it's only say 70 or 100 fireworks injury in Kansas City area, but per person who's gonna have it, it's gonna be 100%. Yes. And, and that is the challenge. I think we have to remember that um, when professionals work with explosive devices, they tend to have a fair amount of manufacturing rigor, they tend to have a lot of safety equipment on, and they tend to do it at a distance. distance. All three of those things are negated when you're working with a firework. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are a lot of manufacturing standards for fireworks. Just about anybody can make them. People don't operate at a distance they're right there on top of them, and they don't wear protective equipment. Correct. So it, we, we, we increase the risk of danger just by doing it. Now, is it fun? So I, I can't tell you how many matchbox cars I blew up in my sandbox when I was a kid. I did, mm -hmm. I mean, I was all into the little firecrackers yep. and things yep. like that. As I got older, a couple things happened. There was a near miss, and it spooked me. And I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna start going fishing on the 4th of July, because I don't have to worry about that. No. And you know, with my kids, it's like, yeah, we're not doing fireworks at home. And I sometimes I think, well, I miss it, but at the end of the day, I, I don't miss the possibility of the injuries. Yeah. And I, I know we talked a lot about kind of the more explosive type kind of fireworks, but simple enough fireworks, sparklers, Roman candle, they are very common reasons for us to see you know, like our pediatric, the ch uh, like uh, pediatric burn patients. And it is because it's a very, very high temperature, very close to the body, essentially hand, and any mistake of just suddenly touching it or the, spar like the sparkles kind of landing on the hand and child becoming kind of, oh, gonna get scared, drops it on their feet. Yeah. Like we do see those burns like every time uh, around the July 4th time and unfortunately in pediatric patient at a pediatric age the burns are more common not from explosives those are the worst ones but the most common ones are the sparklers Roman candle and uh, lots of other more beautiful looking fireworks seemingly very safe fireworks but those are the ones that lead to kind of burn and in your case, what a tragedy to have to go through all that. That's just crazy. We're going to visit with uh, nurse manager Catherine Golson. You're in the tank room. Catherine, talk to us about what yes. happens in there. And is there still a tank? Because when I was young and working in the bird unit, there was a tank. But I hear there may not even be a tank now. So talk to us a little bit about what, what happens in the so-called tank room. Yeah, so a lot of our patients can come here. You guys already discussed second and third degree burns. We bring those patients in here. And it's a place where we can really wash them and get them really, really clean. Get all that dirt, debris, um, and all that dead skin tissue off our patient. We clean them with an antiseptic solution. Um, we also can use these water hoses here to irrigate our patients, to irrigate those wounds. We partner with the anesthesia team as well, so they can um, manage pain, anxiety, they monitor the patient's vital signs, so that our hydrotherapy team comes in here, they wear all the garb, and they can just focus on the patient's wounds. So which of the patients need hydrotherapy? How do you determine who gets it, who doesn't get it? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, um, if it's firework related injuries like today those those wounds can be really dirty so almost any patient can come in here if they've got second third degree burns so any patient we really want to get clean um, we also uh, our physical therapy and occupational therapy offer a passive range of motion while our patients are in here so it's a really great opportunity to provide that wound care while the patient is more comfortable if they can't um, really tolerate the pain that's associated with like a bedside dressing. So of course the goal for all of our patients is that we do less and less tank procedures and they start to tolerate more and more bedside procedures as they start to heal and then we can get them home. So um, this does not look like a bathtub to me. No. <laughs> 
And it, it didn't used to be that, I, I can't think, I'm wrong. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So the biggest difference between this and a bathtub, obviously it's not a bathtub. Historically, they did used to be big tanks or big bathtubs. Um, and we've, uh, you know, through research and whatnot, that's not really best practice anymore. This is really helpful for us to, like I said, irrigate that dirt and debris, really get it washed off the patient so they're not sitting in all of that dirt and debris and increasing their risk for infection. So. Yeah, it's a I really great those. place for us to provide wound stuff. care. Yeah, the biggest advantage here is that there is uh, no chance for cross contamination. For each patient, there is a new uh, layer kind of that is placed, and it is also slanted, so no fluid collects. All fluid runs down at the lower end, like toward the feet, or mostly towards the feet. Means depending on how we kind of place the patient, but that is the advantage. That that like history, like say work over years have shown that this is the better practice. So almost there are no tanks remaining in the United States. There were some burn centers within last kind of say decade or so. Eventually got rid of their old historic tanks. So Dr. Bobstar, and, and, and Dr. Schler, talk to us about any new research, what's coming in the field of burn injuries, because there still are a lot of burn injuries. Absolutely, and I, I think kind of we're going to talk about two different things. Uh, I'll talk about like uh, something called enzymatic debridement, and, and I think uh, Dr. Slater is going to talk about we call uh, spray on skin. So I'm going to start with um, enzymatic debriding agent. So if you think of like how do we take care of the burns, the, the, there are parts, like the burns that are uh, able to heal themselves, second degree burns, they still have a layer of dead tissue that has to clear before the wound healing starts. And deeper second degree burns have thicker layer of dead tissue. Mm. Now, there is a new enzyme product available in market which just got released last year and I think we are going through that where uh, it is available now for use at our institution. We have almost 10 years of experience using that because we were part of the research study that allowed FDA to approve it. So we have amongst top two or three number, like in terms of the experience and number of patients that we have used it on. And it is a product that can uh, reduce the need for surgery. Now, it's not that if it's an 80% burn, 90% burn, that we can just use this to avoid surgery. But it is where the patients have a modest size burn, patients are not the healthiest, or there are reasons why we would want to minimize the risk, uh, like risk of surgery. This is a product that can be used to completely dissolve and remove the dead layer of skin, and then decide if the wound can heal or will need skin graft, but we are minimizing that surgical excision, means removal of dead skin. And I, I think it is going to kind of change uh, kind of treatment of quite a few patients, and kind of we are very excited about it. And again, we just did that presentation at our annual meeting of the Burn Association. We are ready to publish that experience. Um, and I think, I think we're excited about that part. That sounds really cool. Now, it sounds yeah. like you've got some cool stuff. Yeah, so spray skin. Spray on skin. Spray on skin. Okay. It's uh, been here at KU for several months now. We've used it on several patients. Mm -hmm. It was actually approved by the FDA back in 2018 for adults, but only just last year for the pediatric patients. So we can use it for both our adults and our kids when they need surgery. And this is really geared towards those patients that have large burns and don't have as much donor site. So it allows us to, you saw that mesher machine, it allows us to cut bigger holes in the graft and spray their own skin cells in between so that they heal faster, almost as if the holes were smaller, um, but without using quite as much skin as what we had to so, use before. Uh, let me get this straight. First of all, does this help wrinkles for old guys like me? <laughs> it does not help wrinkles. Okay, well I thought I should ask. Yes. So, but, but you take somebody's skin, mm -hmm. you somehow kind of grind it up and then you spray it back? Yeah, so it actually goes into a machine or a kind of a kit that's right in the operating room um, and there's enzymes in there that help kind of break it down so that then you get the, the epidermis and the dermis to kind yeah. of break apart and you can uh, bring it up into a syringe and then spray those skin cells right directly on the patient oh. within about 30 to 40 minutes. Guys, that's so, just, that, very that, this stuff, okay, I'm going to use some enzymes to take away my old skin, I'm going to take my skin and give myself spray new skin. On. That's pretty cool stuff. Obviously, you all have come a long, long way. It's <laughs> tremendous. Definitely. Yes. All right, well, we're going to be here to answer your questions, so send them in using the info on your screen. That includes the chat on YouTube or Facebook and, or emailing the Medical News Network. Let's check in with Doc Hawk, Dr. Hawkeye. 
Hey, last week, the CDC sent a health advisory telling doctors to look out for patients infected with the dengue virus. Now, that's a mosquito-borne virus that usually stays in the tropical and subtropical areas like South America. That's changing with climate change. Hawk, talk to us about it. Yeah, I think it's really important to note and understand that about climate change and really the vector that we're dealing with, and that is the mosquito, particularly the 80s mosquito, um, which can spread dengue, but also can spread Zika, which we've heard of, uh, as well as chikungunya, which is another virus that we've talked about as well. Um, they have noted that certainly um, Puerto Rico has had a significant uh, increase and outbreak of this viral disease, again, dengue virus. Um, and then there also have been now a couple local uh, transmissions of the disease in the Florida Keys as well. And so it is very concerning. In fact, KDHE actually launched a uh, health alert network, uh, our, our announcement uh, this past week telling doctors to be aware of this and healthcare providers to be aware uh, of this viral disease. So again, it's dengue virus. There are four serotypes. Um, most people, uh, when they do get ill, will have headache, fever, muscle aches, uh, bone pain. They can have nausea and vomiting. Unfortunately, one in 20 can progress to severe disease, which could lead to an ICU stay and certainly death as well. So it is vitally important to understand, uh, number one, about this vector that, that spreads this virus, but also understand that, you know, as we do have more of this climate change, and what are we talking about in particular? Certainly warmer temperatures, um, these rains that come through and, and uh, are able to uh, dump a lot of rain. We then have pools of water, which are very good for the mosquitoes to replicate. Um, we can certainly see uh, maybe these uh, mosquitoes, uh, but also the virus and the infection moving north. Again, we have seen it um, in the Caribbean. We have seen it in Puerto Rico, and now some recent local transmission in the Florida Keys as well. So I think it's gonna be very important to understand that. Um, but also, what can we do to protect ourselves? So again, it's the mosquito. This particular mosquito uh, bites during the day. Um, so we need to protect even when we're outside during the day. But we do have the ability to have this mosquito in our region. Uh, but also, we have to understand that there is West Nile virus. And for the last two summers, KDHE has also put out health alerts for West Nile virus. Now it's a different mosquito. It's a mosquito that bites during the nighttime. However, the protection mechanism, mechanisms, the prevention mechanisms are the same. It is wearing long clothes. It is wearing insect repellent uh, with DEET or anything else that is, is uh, EPA approved to help repel insects as well. Uh, and those things are gonna be the best thing to help prevent bites from the mosquitoes and the potential transmission of any of these infections as well. Well, that's a pretty that's a pretty uh, uh, difficult you know message really because we we're going to see more of it I think as temperatures warm and we see more tropical diseases here in the Midwest. So both West Nile virus and dengue fever um, are a challenge. And I know we had cases last year of both, and looks like more coming this direction as the climate changes. You think? Yeah, I think we have to assume that at this point, and we have to assume that so that we can be able to uh, give that information to people and let the uh, let those people understand that and protect themselves. Uh, you know, we have seen recent in uh, severe infections of West Nile virus around the state of Kansas, but also here at our health system and locally in our in our community, and it has it does impact those people as well. So I think it is very important to understand these prevention techniques against uh, these vectors, whether it's mosquitoes or ticks, are really the same. It's the long clothes, it's being aware of your situation, it's wearing the insect repellent. Certainly if you're out working uh, in, in uh, the garden or working in brush, and you know that there are ticks around, obviously doing tick checks later when you come in. Uh, but we are in a constant battle with the world around us. Uh, and cur currently right now, we're, we're speaking about these uh, insect vectors, these ticks 
and these mosquitoes. Um, but we can do things to help prevent you from getting bit uh, by those insects and infected with these bacteria and viruses that those insects can harbor. I know I always smell better with deep woods off around me, and so that's what I keep doing. And I'm just going to look really quickly at our plastic steams. You're not worried about all that deed on our skin, right? Um, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. No, I would just say if you're going to use it because you're going to be out, when you come back in, just get a good shower with soap and water and get it off. Yeah. And obviously don't touch eyes, mouth, right when it's still wet on your skin. And you'll smell better then too. Now, so Hawkeye, <laughs> any COVID updates? Feels like our, I was talking to one of our uh, urgent care doctors. They're like, I just saw seven new COVID patients the last couple of days. Uh, any sense of the, the community where COVID's, what's COVID do, is doing out there? Yeah, well, uh, and I would certainly say before we get to that, we know it's going to be the holiday weekend. So wear your sunscreen. And if you are wearing sunscreen and insect repellent, it is always important to put on the sunscreen first and then the insect repellent. As far as COVID goes, certainly um, throughout the nation, it is um, still in uh, low, uh, the low area as far as recognition. And most of this is because of wastewater that they're doing the testing where they can see levels of the virus in the wastewater. Again, that's most of the nation. The West in particular though, has seen an increase over the past few weeks. Hawaii has seen an increase, although it looks like their wastewater testing is showing decreased levels as well. Uh, but in the West, there seems to be high uh, levels. And again, that is all relative to where it's been uh, throughout the pandemic as well. Certainly overall, it's much lower. Um, but right now it's a little bit higher than it has been. Uh, but most of the, the communities across the nation otherwise have low activity at this point. Some of the experts do expect a little bit of a bump in the summer. Um, but again, like you said, the data is hard to come by and a lot of what we're using to extrapolate from is that wastewater data. There's also a new variant which seems to be out there, um, LB1, which is a uh, variant of the JN1. Right now, I don't think there's anything to be too concerned about. Again, we know that there is um, immune evasion by all of these variants, and that is mostly specifically for the antibodies um, that, that our body produces, but we still have very good T cell immunity to these variants. Nothing fundamental has seemed to have changed with this virus or the disease it causes. And nonetheless, a lot of people have uh, vaccination immunity, infection or reinfection immunity, or a combination of both of those. All right, thank you, sir. This has been a yeah. terrific start so far. Let's go to Alexis Del Cid, because I know she's been watching for questions from our community. Alexis. We have a question from Yen Liang. So Yen wants to know, um, we know we should put cold water on a burn. Is there any reason why someone should not put ice on a burn? Can ice do more damage? Great question. Yeah, great question. And um, commonly not known, but definitely don't put ice on a burn. So when you're putting ice on a wound, you're doing it to try and decrease swelling, which means that it causes your blood vessels to get smaller, called vasoconstriction. And when that happens with a burn, it actually decreases the amount of blood flow to the burn and it can cause it to get deeper or worsen the burn. You're also more prone to tissue damage like frostbite because your sensation is gonna be altered. So cool water is, is great um, as long as it's from a clean source, uh, but definitely no ice. What about tap water, is that clean? That's clean. Okay. So even when I burn myself in the kitchen, I'm always burning myself in the kitchen, but I'm always putting ice on it. Don't do even that, please. <laughs> <laughs> that was no. Alexis, no, do we need to have a conversation about your skills in the kitchen? I know. No, join, get in line. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Enser wants to know, are there any types of burns or places on the body that are easier or more difficult to do grafts on? Uh, any area? So. I think I'll be bragging to say that, yeah, I mean, this is what we are trained for. We should be able to take care of kind of doing skin grafts anywhere on the body and take skin graft from anywhere on the body. But I'll say it is always difficult to kind of get really good, even skin graft and, and the results for, say, if it's a bad facial burn, right? It is, it is difficult. Uh, same thing for the neck. Not that we cannot do the grafting, but the, 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 how the healing happens, how the scarring happens, how we are, our ability to control that process of healing and scar contracture is difficult. So I would say uh, even if it's not difficult,
difficult surgically or as difficult for us with experience. It is very difficult to manage the outcomes or say control how things will work out. Um, and, and I think um, other areas, we are just routinely doing it. I don't think we even think per, from the perspective of difficulty. Cool. Joellen has an excellent question. Joellen wants to know if there are ever mental health professionals involved in the care for burn patients. Absolutely. We are so blessed here to have great mental health support. We utilize both our psychiatry teams, but also really our neuropsych rehab team, who is um, phenomenal here, led by Dr. Carrillo, and they are involved with all of our major uh, burn patients that are admitted, um, both helping with any mental health problems that they had coming in, but it's very common in these large burns to see acute stress disorders, start developing PTSD symptoms, and they're just so helpful helpful with it. Did you have any of that? I would say I had slight PTSD. Um, just the noise of fireworks was very mm -hmm. triggering for me for a while and the, actually the smell of sulfur. Oh yeah. I had a hard time oh. with that for a few years but luckily it's been over 10 years and I'm pretty trigger free at this <laughs> point. Alexis. I have a question for Jordy. Um, what is the sensation like in the areas where you were badly burned? Is there any lack of sensation or is it more delicate? No, I have full sensation in all of my burns. Um, in the winter, my feet and ankles get a little sensitive at times. You can just kind of get like the tingling nerve, like you're almost like your foot fell asleep, and so I'm aware of that. So but the Chiefs Dolphins game would not have been good for you last year, is that right? No, okay. not good yep, at all. Got it. I do want to mention something, and sorry, like this is uh, so for Jordy, her burns were mostly second degree, even like quite a bit areas of deep, deep second degree burn. Uh, we made sure that we did everything to avoid skin grafting to a point that we did this uh, kind of specific kind of sequence of treatments that allowed us to have her not require skin graft. So we did those, we call it serial cleaning of the wounds. We used a specific kind of water knife kind of tool to clean those wounds to remove as much layer of dead skin without removing any viable skin and also used uh, pig skin as a graft to help it heal and, and uh, not need skin graft. So it was a little bit of longer duration for healing, but eventually it healed without skin grafting and preserved as much of the skin as possible. That probably contributed to not having as much of an altered or loss of sensation. All right. Well, this has been an amazing discussion, and I want to thank you, and really thank you, Jordan, oh, for no being problem. on our program to tell your story. That takes a great deal of courage. Just having to be a burn patient takes a lot of courage, I think. Let's hear final thoughts from all of our guests. Catherine, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Um, you know, we're here and we're ready. Our teams are ready to treat patients if anything unfortunate happens, but we're really, really hoping everybody has a safe um, and happy 4th of July, spend good time with friends and family, but ultimately be safe. You know, that's a great point. You know, just to say, I, mean, I think the greatest gift of the burn unit is a boring 4th of July. So, all right, Jordy, final thoughts. Um, I'll repeat what she said, be safe, be aware not only of where you are, but those around you. Because when you take fireworks in your own hands, you're taking that into everyone else around you's hand. So just be conscious of other people, safe distance, and really if you can, find something local. We have so many things in our community and we're so blessed with that. Go sit and park yourself in a lawn chair with your family and just watch the professionals do yeah. it. It may be raining, but uh, I yeah. think this year yes. we'll see what, Dr. Bonshaw. Oh, uh, my daughters love when I kind of mention this. Uh, I know, again, the statistics works uh, kind of in favor of you because only 100 or so burners bur happen during July 4th weekend. But make sure you're not one of them and make sure you're not that, that stupid. <laughs> well, and, and the problem is you can't control it a lot of the times. Right. Exactly. These things happen because exactly. of manufacturing flaws. That yep. You don't know. So yep. every time you're doing it, it's a throw of the dice. Exactly. Dr. Slater. 
Um, absolutely, safety is key for this, but definitely if you have any little ones around you and anyone around you is doing fireworks, make sure just like if you were at a pool, you always have eyes on the, the kids because in a split second, they can go over and reach for something they shouldn't. We are blessed here to be able to treat both kids and adults and be the region's only verified burn center that does treat both. Um, and so we're here to help, but just extra eyes on the kiddos. So uh, I want to thank for everybody for watching and listening. And uh, just to say out, out loud, a shout out to our burn unit team. Great representation here, but there's a whole team out there that are doing this work every day. It is a labor of love. I've always thought this is one of the hardest of all human injuries because of the mental part, and it can be so disfiguring. And the work that you and your teams do to bring people back to life and to bring them back to as normal life they can is nothing short of astonishing and just such a great act of faith for people. So, I mean, it's an act of love, and I just wanna say thanks to all of you for doing that. And it tells us what we can do when we work together. We see a lot of fights out there in society and things like that, but the miracles we've spoken about today are the example of what happens when we let faith, hope, and science work together. We can have a better life. That's what being in medicine is about. That's what we wanna do with you. Let's hope we can do that in our everyday life as well. Thank you for being part of this program. Remember, together we can live long and prosper. Coming up Friday on the Morning Medical Update, Kenny Karcheski knew he had a heart murmur, but he refused to believe that open heart surgery was the only solution. I'm Alexis Delsit. On the next Morning Medical Update, a second opinion uncovers a less invasive option that had Kenny back on his feet within days, Friday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.